Welcome back, everybody, to our final Pub 101 meeting in the Open Textbook Network. Last week, you'll remember, we transitioned into talking more about publishing pathways and different options for you to accomplish your Open Textbook publishing goals. And we heard from Elvis and Mike at Scribe. They talked about editing and design, as well as a little bit more about working with Scribe. And as a reminder, in the new year, if you decide to join the co-op, you can opt into additional training to learn more about Scribe's workflows. This week, we're going to learn more about Pressbooks, another publishing pathway and training option for you if you decide to join the co-op. So while Scribe is a publishing services provider, they offer editing, design, production services, Pressbooks is a publishing platform and they offer a WordPress-based editing environment for multiple authors, as well as a variety of file types that you can produce at the click of a button. These two pathways are not necessarily mutually exclusive. For example, Stephanie at Oregon State identified that some of the open textbook projects she had going there in their pipeline needed professional editing. So she's been working with Elvis at Scribe on that, but we'll publish the textbooks using Pressbooks. So in the new year, we're also going to offer training in partnership with Pressbooks for co-op members. And so you can sign up for one or both of those trainings as part of co-op membership. Before I hand things over to Liz Mays, our guest today, I would like to remind you that if you don't already, you can access the Open Textbook Network's Pressbooks EDU Sandbox another benefit that we are able to offer in partnership with Pressbooks. And I'm going to put a link in the chat for that now. There it is. Um, this benefit allows every institution, all 1,000 plus of them that are covered in both direct institutional and consortial memberships, every institution can create one free openly licensed project per institution. Um, and even if you don't have a project in mind, you're welcome to request a login if you just want to play around, look and see what Pressbooks can do, treat it like an actual sandbox. Don't hesitate to fill out that form. It takes us a few days to coordinate and whitelist your institution, um, but within usually a week or so, I'll send you an email letting you know next steps, and you can log in, and if you want, add additional users. Um, who can work on a particular project and experiment in Pressbooks. Before the hour is up, I'm going to share next steps with you about how to sign up for these trainings I keep talking about, um, how to sign up for the co-op or express your interest, and you know that I get really excited about your feedback, and so I very much want your feedback about Pub 101, including these Wednesday meetings. It's really important to me, it's going to benefit your colleagues, so please do take a few minutes to go ahead and do it. I'll share those links uh, after we hear from Liz. Speaking of Liz, without further ado, I would um, like to introduce you to Liz Mays, who just turned on her camera. Uh, Liz is the Director of Sales and Marketing at Pressbooks, as well as an editor of an open textbook called Media Innovation and Entrepreneurship. So she brings multiple perspectives today. Um, which I'm really excited about. She's going to talk to you about topics you learned about in Unit 5, including printing, not as easy as it seems, and ISBNs <laughs> and how they relate to printing, as well as talk a little bit more about Pressbooks. So um, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions for Liz, or I hope you will, um, and we'll save those uh, for the end. She has about uh, 20 minutes of content planned, and then we'll um, have time for your discussion and um, time to do some sign-ups and wrap things up in Pub 101. So thank you very much, Liz, for joining us. I'll hand things over to you. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I just pulled up the open textbook Karen had referenced. Um, and uh, should you want to, uh, should you have an appropriate program, you could download this print PDF and have this printed on demand for your program um, that is something you can do with books that are built on Pressbooks that have this feature enabled. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about too much about Pressbooks today. Um, I am going, the only thing I'd really want to say about Pressbooks is that it enables you to very easily get the files that you need to print. Um, 
and to format them in the way that the printers will accept so that you do not have an arduous process when you do go to print on demand. Um, and that is, you know, one of its big uh, key features in you know, in the OER publishing process. Uh, but for now, I was asked to talk about printing and ISBNs, and I am essentially uh, going to share with you my journey uh, with various print-on-demand um, trials and errors and tell you um, some things that I learned and some things that I learned from and hope that that benefits you as you go down these same roads. Um, as Karen said, I'm Director of Sales and Marketing with Pressbooks. Previously, I worked with the Rebus community. Um, I have also been an assistant director inside a large university. And prior to that, um, I have been a freelance editor, writer, and marketer uh, doing a variety of consulting projects, including some book-related projects. So my first experience with print-on-demand was as an author and then later as an editor helping others get their books uh, into these formats. And at the time, I was so excited about um, self-publishing was just coming to be a thing you could do, and uh, Amazon made it really easy to get your book out there. And I had discovered Pressbooks, which essentially I was using to create the formats that would otherwise be really difficult to then throw into Amazon and other print-on-demand outlets. And one of the things I used at the time as CreateSpace. Now, of course, this no longer exists, but at the time, the hardest part about CreateSpace was getting the files you needed. Um, and the interior file, with you, when you have a print-on-demand book, you need two files. You need the interior file, which is basically everything inside the book, and then you need the cover file, which on a print book is a little more complicated because it's the front, the back, and the spine at a very exact specification for the size that is based on the trim size, the page count, the page weight, all of these interesting things. And generally for a designer to produce that, it's super easy. But for me, not being a designer, not wanting to work with like those, you know, Adobe InDesign or something like that, it would have been very hard. But eventually Pressbooks created um, a tool for that as well. So I was able to pretty easily get content uh, into Amazon and imprint on demand at the time was done through CreateSpace. And what you would need is your banking information so they could deposit royalties, uh, your tax number so they could essentially report your royalties should you do very well to the government, uh, metadata like the author and the publisher and you know ISBNs, different things like that about the book. Um, and then you would just say magically like send me a proof um, and it would take like a few days and it was like five dollars per proof and you could just do it over and over over until you got it right. And then you could order author copies the same way, very quickly, very easy. And when you were done and happy, you would press publish. And sadly, CreateSpace went away. Um, it kind of got pulled under the Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing umbrella. Um, and unfortunately, once I moved into this OER world, I found that it actually didn't allow you to print on demand anything that had a Creative Commons license. So it wouldn't have been very useful for our context either. Um, KDP, which now does have a print on demand option, was also very easy. Um, you go into their interface, you give it your banking and tax info, you give it, in this case, a Mobi file. Uh, I was making my front covers for ebooks on Canva, which is a free tool. And then again, the metadata preview go live, super easy. I have not actually tried their new print on demand option. It is a possibility um, that you may want to try. Um, I have not tried it, but I did run into um, a couple issues that I think you would run into as an organization doing that. So as an individual, Amazon is incredible because A, it's super easy. Um, B, it was very simple to order publisher copies quickly and cheaply. Um, and this is actually a book that I helped to bring into um, the Amazon store for my um, aunt and uncle, who it is their story of surviving cancer together. Um, and this is perfect for them. They can send the link to all their friends and colleagues and the people you know they do fundraising with and people buy the book and they review the book. And Amazon is a great place that you want your book to be, um, especially if you are a self-publishing author. For organizations, however, I was so gung-ho. I was at the center, um, a business journalism center at a university, and I was like, wow, here could be like this really great new revenue model. We have all this content. Let's make an ebook. Let's make a print-on-demand version. 
let's hand out marketing copies at all the conferences we're going to anyway. I was super excited, right? However, um, I tried very hard, uh, actually very hard to um, be able to set up this book in Amazon on behalf of the university. And I ran into a couple of roadblocks, one of which is surprisingly, um, nobody at the university wanted to give me their one bank account. I just thought that was so <laughs> unfair. But as you can imagine, you might run into similar issues. Um, likewise for their tax number and different things like that. And then there was the question of, can we as a university even receive like all these like $1 payments or nine? dollar payments and what do we do with the royalties like how would that be taxed and what about the security of sending people to a place to buy something from us as the university what happens if like Amazon has a data breach and all of those sorts of questions were like complicated so eventually I gave up and this book never went into print on demand um, through Amazon which is quite a shame um, other things to consider is I learned later that Amazon is a really, it's a serious decision. So even though it's super easy to put your book up there, if you do that, there is actually a weird nuance um, with Ingram. Like if later you decide, oh, I think I'm going to do Ingram Spark. I'm ready for that. Um, you actually would have to pull your content off Amazon and wait um, a very long period, in my opinion, um, if you later want to do that. And it's not just like if you wanted to publish this book later on Ingram, it's if you, if you have published a book on Amazon and print on demand and you later want to publish a book, a different book, or the same book on Ingram, you have this weird waiting period. So you, you do need to think seriously about the options before going forward. Another experience I've had is with Lightning Source. Um, a long while back, we thought we would do printing for self-publishing authors at Pressbooks. It's not a service we currently offer. Um, and part of the reason for that was, you know, we went down this road and we were going to attempt this with Lightning Source, which is fantastic for professional quality hardcover, high quality books. Um, if you are a serious publisher, either as a university or a small press, this is one option to definitely look into. But for us trying to do the things we were doing, there were a lot of um, obstacles. So there were setup fees um, that were pretty high. Um, there were file change fees um, that made it very like scary for us with our inexperience in the area at the time. And it's one thing if you were like going to print, you know, a thousand books or something, like all of those things you would never care because at the end of the day, they'd all, you know, amortize out across that. But if you were printing, you know, five print on demand books for a self-publishing author, like you would obviously be going in the red every time you would do that. And then there was the issue of like my time in the setup or anyone's time. This is not like, there is not a margin on doing this for other people. And there was considerable time involved. Um, I have heard from people who do have print on demand programs at universities like there's a person there's a real resource attached to that it's not like something you just do on the side in five minutes like time goes into it um, but then we did try um, when I was with Rebus uh, community we did print on demand for a few of the books that we supported um, and we decided at the time to try this with Ingram spark which is essentially a sister company with lightning source here too, you need your banking and tax info to set up an account. You need the metadata about the book, and you do need to meet some formatting specs for both the interior and the cover. Uh, Ingram definitely is very, um, they have a very particular PDF output format that they need, uh, and they have very, they'll flag your uh, file for image issues, whether your images are too small or too large. And sometimes you can move forward and it's just a warning. And sometimes it's more like, nope, we can't do anything with this. Um, so those are some issues. Um, Pressbooks essentially will, is the way to get a file that actually just meets those things by default. But it's a lot to grapple with um, if you don't necessarily have that solution. Um, and then at a certain point, you can be ready to sign off on your proof. Um, the mailed proofs uh, took a little longer for me, so I always went with digital proofs here, but then I would do like a short run of author copies or publisher copies to make sure that they looked okay um, in a sort of a low stakes uh, environment before I would go ahead and push it through. Um, one thing you have to remember uh, when they can help you with both publishing and printing and distributing, it's up to you. Like you could just put your book up there and print it for yourself and people who ask for it. You could put it up there and distribute it through to the other stores. Uh, it's really up to you. Um, but one thing to know, if you do 
uh, distribute it you, where other people can buy it, it's important not to accept returns. Because if you select the box to check returns, that essentially means that the bookstores who might buy boxes of this book and not sell them, they can return those to Ingram and you get charged for the return shipping, which means like even if you, they never sell a book on your behalf, you could be going into the red without making any revenue at all. So that's a scary thing to avoid. Um, and, and a couple other things uh, that were good is the revision costs were a lot lower. So it made it possible, like I made some mistakes. Like, of course, your first time trying anything, you make lots of mistakes. I you know, found a mistake in the actual file that needed to be done. So I probably paid for quite a few revision fees um, at first, but it didn't really matter because they were low enough that it wasn't so high stakes. Um, it also allows you to push a book into Amazon, Barnes and Noble, other bookstores where students or faculty could buy it directly. Um, the challenge with that is that it really can take um, six to eight weeks. So when I saw that, I thought, oh yeah, yeah. And, and like that package is really gonna take nine business days to get to me. But this particular thing actually does take the full time they say it does. And there's really no way to speed it up. Um, it just, it's an algorithm and it gets sent at the time it gets sent um, whenever it's checking for new things in the distribution centers. And so that can be a little frustrating waiting for it to be purchasable by third parties. Um, also any file changes I made um, reset the clock on that. So I ended up kicking myself for not allowing enough time on print on demand prior to the start of the semester. Um, author copies as well. Um, I had people who wanted to just like buy a number of books and even those um, they can take a couple weeks like two or three weeks uh, to get out and then if you're adding like ground shipping because it's a heavy box that could be like three or four weeks that you need to allow even just to facilitate your own copies if that's what you're hoping to do. With um, this is one example of a book that was done um, in that manner uh, by Rebus on Ingram Spark. You may have seen it at some conferences in person. Um, so I do not have direct experience with Lulu, but I did some research into this in all of these um, trials and errors, and I've talked with others who have done both research and pragmatic experience with it, and I've heard a few things that I think are worth sharing today. Um, a good thing about it is that it does allow the Creative Commons licenses. Um, and I'll actually preface this by saying there's a couple ways to use Lulu. Lulu.com is what we are talking about here. Um, there is also a way where you can kind of work with Shopify and, and that, that way um, required some other resources. So for today, we'll be talking about Lulu.com. Um, other nice things about this is if you're really trying to reduce the cost of of print on demand copies of a book for your students, this allows you to set royalties at zero dollars as opposed to a mandatory 30%, for instance, at other print on demand places. Um, that's a really nice feature for the intent of people probably on this call. Another nice thing is that you can point people to a place where they can directly order this book. You don't have to wait for it to get into Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Um, you can just say, hey, the book's here, here's a link, buy it. And so that's nice as well. Uh, there is also the option to be paid by check, uh, which may be a little more compatible with the university scenario. And um, a few of the down, downsides that I have heard about is that the trim size options are a little more limited. Um, and if you are trying to do a full color book, an interior color book, that can be a little more expensive than some of the other options out there. Uh, this is one example of a book that was printed on Lulu. I'm allowed to say this by Rebus Community. Um, and this was handed out at Open Ed. Uh, so some of you, I know there were many boxes of this going around. So I'm sure some of you have seen it uh, if you were at that conference. Another option that doesn't get talked about a lot, so I just want to like make sure it's in here, is the Express is the Espresso Book Machine. And this is like a weird thing that um, it's basically like where if you bring a file to someone with this machine, um, typically an organization um, or an institution, they can print you out a book relatively instantly or many books if you prefer. And there are a few that I know of, you can look at the map, I don't wanna get out of my, um, out of my 
screen share right now, but basically I know there's one at Powell's Books in Portland. Um, I've seen it in person as like this big machine. Uh, there is also one at University of Arizona in the library. Um, so, and they will of course help people who are not necessarily uh, U of A students. Um, and, and you may have one at your institution and not even know it. So this is a thing to maybe ask, look at this map, ask around. Uh, you might have one near you, you never know. And then another thing I would pose uh, a question about is sort of this notion of having, maybe not using these print on demand providers that we all know about, but going to your bookstore, can they just make copies of this for you? Can you just hand them the, the PDF file and say, just print this on demand as students buy it. Don't print it all up front. As they come into the store, print a copy for them or, or maybe print 20 copies and have them sitting on the shelves. And when you run out, print some more. Like, could they do book print on demand for you? And if not, does this thing even really truly need to be bound like a book? Like how important is that if the goal of what we're doing with this content we're creating that's open educational resources, if the goal is to lower costs for students, like does it need to look like a book to serve its purpose? And I'm not sure that the answer is yes. Um, however, for a large book, it might not be cheaper uh, to go with a coffee shop or solution like that. I did call around for quotes for like a 300 page book. And I got um, on average, these were the quotes I got from three different places like UPS store and Office Max and FedEx uh, printing. So. For a large book, it might not be a great solution, but for a small book, maybe it would save you all these setup fees, all the time of staff time. You know, maybe you could just get it printed like a course reader. Um, and it, a hundred page book, this might be a good solution and charge, you know, $12 or something, which is still a very nominal cost. Um, and in fact, you might have better rates. A lot of universities have shops inside of them that will do copying where they have a shop where they've negotiated preferential rates, maybe it's like right across the street from the university and they can do things like this as well. So those are things to investigate. And I see activity in the chat. Um, Karen, should I pause? Would you like to read me some questions or should I wait for the end? I was just um, adding to the conversation in terms of the espresso machine that I've seen in person. Cheryl did say that it's no long, there's no longer one at the University of Arizona Library, which is a bummer. Oh, that is a bummer. And it's still on the map, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. I was really excited. I almost drove down there one day to use it. So <laughs> they are really cool, I think. That's awesome. But um, OK, so check with your local local people to see if you might have one. Um, OK, so some considerations to think about as you're doing print on demand anywhere. There are some universal things you're going to need to think about. One of those is print covers. Um, so the biggest issue is sizing. Um, again, these include the front cover, the back cover, and the spine all in one file. They often include something like a barcode for the ISBN. They have to be at a very particular resolution, depending on your printer, and a very particular size, which could be different for a book that is, you know, six by nine than a book that's, you know, five and a half by eight, than a book that's eight and a half by 11. A but they could be even different for a book that is the same trim size. You know, if you have two books that are six by nine, it's going to be different if one of them is 100 pages and one of them is 115 pages. So figuring out that sizing is kind of a pain in the butt. Um, I will talk about a hack that there is um, to do that in Pressbooks, and that's what I do um, if you don't have a designer uh, handy at your service to help with that. You do need to choose a trim size. Um, and sometimes this might be influenced by page count. Like I do have a book that was like, you know, it would have been four or 500 pages if it were a smaller size book. Um, so we made that an eight and a half by 11 just to make it, you know, less thick um, and distribute some of that uh, in the height um, as well. You also need to make some choices about the interior. And I'm going to suggest that if there's any possible way where your book does not need to be color inside, if you do not need that, it is, I and you're trying to lower costs, I would recommend um, trying to keep your interior where it could be an equal experience for people if printed in black and white as printed in color. Um, I do 
know of, I believe it was BC Campus that told me that they allow their students to choose from a color interior book and a black and white interior book on certain books, which I think is a nice solution. Then if you want to pay for that option, then great, but at least you've made it as um, affordable as possible for others. Um, usually I would think you're probably not too concerned about the type of paper here, um, but if you were self-publishing, you might be. And then there's the percentage of royalty your print-on-demand provider might take. Um, with Ingram, the minimum we were able to set was 30%, and I'll show you how that costs out um, in a future slide. Um, you definitely want to make sure that whoever you're using allows you to print Creative Commons licensed materials. And another thing to keep in mind is that when you do print on demand, you have to enter your institution, whoever's info is in that account, you're saying you're the publisher. And so this may or may not want to be something you want to do with materials that you haven't vetted or don't feel were vetted um, through a traditional publishing process. Um, or maybe you won't worry about that. But technically you are stating that you are the publisher when you do this and that may push through to the metadata in other places where people are able to buy the book. Other things to keep in mind, um, let's say down the road you have to replace the first edition uh, with a new edition. Uh, I've always been a little worried that uh, when we do that, that people are going to start scalping the first edition copies. Uh, I don't know if that will actually happen. Um, but again, that's something to think about. Another thing is the crediting of contributors. So many of the open educational resources will have quite a few contributors collaborating on something. And the limits are different from platform to platform, but um, sometimes they're not enough. So I had a book that at the time, I want to say, had 11 main authors. And Amazon would only let us credit nine. Ingram, which is where we were putting the book in and distributing to Amazon through Ingram for that book, uh, it only allowed us to credit three. So in the end, we had to decide who are the people who deserve credit. And that was a very difficult process that involved quite a few conversations. Um, ultimately, we decided to credit just the editors, but then we also needed to credit everybody else in the description because there's no other way to push that info through to the store. Um, so keep those types of things in mind as you're doing these big projects, like who are the designated people who will be called the, auth the authors. Um, setup costs. Uh, so a lot of times like print on demand is awesome because you're not paying anything up front for the privilege of printing and you're not having to pay for things and store them. However, again, there are those setup costs usually and there are the costs of your time to set this up. Usually you're not going to break even on book number one or even book 15, maybe at book 50, maybe at book 25, you might start to break even on the costs you've invested in that. Here's an example. Um, we looked at pricing. This was from several years ago, but the book would, we were going to price the book at $20 for the end user. There was a mandatory 30% royalty and a mandatory $9 printing cost. Um, by the time you're done with that, there was a $5 profit. So again, your goal is to keep margins low, but you can only keep them so low because printing costs money and shipping costs money. And are you going to eat those shipping costs if you are going to like order a large amount for the bookstore? Is the bookstore going to eat the shipping costs or do they need to pass those on? There's lots of things to think about, um, including the royalties, including where you'll distribute it. And the other thing I want to encourage you to do is just think about that lead time. I would not recommend doing this. If you're going to set up print on demand for something you want for fall semester, I would say four weeks is still probably not enough. Um, I would suggest about eight weeks, and I think that's really tough in academia because you might be working on a book in the summer during everyone's time off, or they're, you know, and you're, it, the summer goes by really fast, I have found, um, and making everything, having all those files final and just ready to upload, if you backed that up by four weeks, like you might need those on June 15th or something, which is when you're just beginning to think about putting this book together in some cases. Um, so just something, food for thought. So I'm going to try not to be too opinionated about ISBNs, but um, people who sell ISBNs will tell you you need more than two for a book, that you need one for every single file format. Um, I think a standard good middle of the road thing to do would be to, to and 
expected thing to do would be to do one for the ebook and one for print on demand, but people will tell you, well, if you have a Mobi and you have an EPUB, you need one for each. And they'll tell you, you know, all sorts of, you'll need all sorts of combinations. And, and that's really up to you to decide. Uh, they can be pretty pricey. Um, as a person, I typically would go with the ebook and the print on demand. Uh, you may want to do more, uh, but the pricing is so high for one and so low for 10 that I suggest if you're ever going to do more than one format of one book, you might as well just buy those 10 and hold on to them. Um, there is also the possibility here that you could find them cheaper um, from resellers, but then those resellers, in theory, could designate themselves as the publisher of that book, though I think that's highly unlikely. Um, again, when you're a university, these are things you probably don't want to leave up to chance um, in the way that maybe a self-publishing author could. Okay, so if I have not discouraged you too much from printing on demand, um, here are some things to think about to prepare for this first time that you do it. You will definitely need what I call the interior file, which is everything inside the book. Um, Pressbooks has a very easy PDF export and there's a print version of the PDF export in Pressbooks. You can just download that and then it will meet the specs by default or you could prepare this, um, a designer could prepare this using all sorts of software. They would just need to meet the very specific specs of your print on demand provider. Um, the cover file uh, is another thing where I've said, as I've said, this is complicated. I'll show you a little bit of a hack in Pressbooks, um, or your designer can read the specs for your particular situation, but you want to do this when the book is finished. You need to know the page count. You need to know the final thing is there. Uh, you also need the number of pages, and they have to be divisible by two. Uh, you need to choose the type of cover you want, the type of interior color or not, your paper, and then you need some basic information about the book. Everything from the title, the language of the book, the book description, uh, the contributors, keywords you might want people searching on to find the book with, categories, and um, these codes are for categories that you might want to put the book into so it gets found, and then usually you will need that tax and royalty payment info. Okay, so I am going to stop sharing this screen for now. And also before I do, I'm also going to say thank you to the wonderful people at Slides Carnival who create wonderful slides that you can basically adapt for yourself for free. Um, I'm going to do like a quick, I'm going to check the chat and then do a quick demo of one little thing in Pressbooks and then take questions. Um, hold on just a moment. Okay. Okay. Well all clear in chat, Liz. Sounds good. So I'm going to share one other screen real quick. Oops, actually, it's the same screen. I, uh, I need to escape. Ah, here we go. Okay. So again, um, as I said, I don't want to talk too much about Pressbooks today. Uh, but let's say you were in, if you aren't familiar with Pressbooks, Let's say you had access to the Pressbook Sandbox and you have created this book uh, there. The place you would find the print-on-demand interior file is on the export screen. Once you've set up your book, uh, ignore this. Uh, this is the export that you would want. And you would just click export your book and then you would have something like this which you can download to your computer. Uh, the other thing I will not demonstrate thoroughly, but I'll give you a sense of is this cover generator. This is something I almost never talk about, but it's really relevant for today's um, discussion. So uh, with ebooks, I tend to create, I use a thing called Canva, which you may be familiar with, and they have like a paid version where you can designate the um, dimensions of your cover for the ebook to meet whatever ebook store requirement there is for the front cover. And that's a nice solution. It's like $12 a month, I think, and you only have to subscribe for one month. So when I need a book cover, I subscribe for one month and I make my book cover for the ebook. What I do though with that paid version is they will allow you to create higher resolution files of certain dimensions. So then I take that ebook cover and I make it the right dimensions and the right um, sizes and proportions and resolution uh, to meet these specs that are listed in the cover generator. Uh, so this is, I can do on Canva a front cover. And so then what I do is I go to this screen for the book that I'm working on and I can do one of two things. Let's assume the front cover is an image and it already has my words on it. I would just add the, uh, 
I think it's something like this um, that will essentially make this field blank on the cover. And I would do the same for anything I would like to leave blank um, because it's already showing. And in fact, so the title will be here. Okay. Uh, then I could add the back cover description here. Uh, I could add an ISBN for the print version, and this will actually generate the barcode for you, which is really nice. Uh, then I would upload that image that I made in Canva that is these dimensions, that is high res. And then <laughs> I would, you know, it will automatically know my page count from my last export, but I'll make sure that I just recently exported. I'll choose my um, my paper type, which does affect the size of this ultimately. And then I can choose colors for the front cover text, if there is any for the back cover text, for the spine background, and you know the back cover background. And what I probably would have done before this is take whatever my front cover is, essentially do the dropper thing on the internet, like research, what is, what is the color for this? What is the CMYK color for this? And then I would just insert that here uh, to make the back cover the same color as the dominant color on the front cover, um, which would, and then I would click make PDF cover. And what this would result in is a file that's, you know, fairly plain, like it has a plain background on the back with some text and the barcode, but what you need. And then it has my image that was high res and sort of goes with the branding for the book on the front. And then it also has the spine with the words going like this. Um, and then and then basically I have what I need. And, you know, I am not trying with OER to create the next bestseller. I am trying to create a thing that is in a place people can buy it um, of a respectable quality, but it, that the end goal is that they can learn from it. And the design choices that I make, no matter how compelling, are not going to change whether or not people can learn from what's inside. So that's what I'm really focused on here. So this will allow you to make an even better than simple cover uh, without needing to essentially bother the designer, the graphic designer on your staff um, if they're slammed and don't really have time to do this in the manual fashion. Um, you could also have student workers uh, enlist in this kind of activity as well. So I will stop sharing now. And I do see something in the chat. It's just me again. Okay. <laughs> giving people a link to Canva in case they were not already familiar. Super. Thank you, Liz. And now is a great time to ask Liz your questions about print on demand, about ISBN, about design. I mean, you can ask Liz a lot of stuff and she will probably have an answer. <laughs> um, while you're thinking of your questions, I'm also going to preview just a bit um, the Pressbooks training that we will be offering with Liz and her colleague Steele in the new year. And um, that includes more about what Pressbooks is, ways you can use it, different workflows, how to create and clone, which is very helpful in our OER environment, how to clone a book, um, how to add interactive elements, and um, other other useful stuff. So um, that's just a preview of what we'll be talking about when we start down our Pressbooks publishing pathway training. Liz is developing a unit dedicated yes. to these topics in our Canvas curriculum. So you will see it show up there in the next couple months and have that as a resource as well. And it will be OER specific. So we're both really excited to be able to offer that to you. And I forgot to state one thing about Pressbooks. Again, I <laughs> did not want to talk too much about Pressbooks today, but I did want to say that even if you find a book that someone else has made available in the PDF format on Pressbooks on another network, there may be 60 different networks or more at this point. So you may find a book built on Pressbooks and have that PDF available to you. Um, in one of the libraries, you might even find it in Open Textbook Network Library um, or BC Campus, uh, Campus's you know, searchable library. And you can print on that on demand if the license allows you to. So we are not just talking about things that you would build yourself in Pressbooks, but other things may be available to you that are already built. Thanks, Liz. 
Cheryl has a question. Um, can you briefly talk or walk, walk us by talking us through the steps to identify an exact CMYK color? Sort of, yes. So I reinvent this process every time, but essentially if you like search the internet, and I always land on a different one, search the internet for CMYK color picker. And generally you'll find like a host of results, all of which vaguely work. Um, and choose the one that seems most attractive to you. And then I would have your front cover sitting on your desktop and it will ask you to take your cursor, the color picker, to whatever color on that image that you want. So you essentially could choose any color that is in the image that you're trying to match. And then it will tell you the, the numbers uh, for that CMYK color. And if you put those into any tool like Pressbooks, like Canva, like really any design tool will allow you to insert those color numbers and that will result in the same color. I also feel like I relearn that process every time. <laughs> and CMYK is short for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. For some reason, the K. The K is key or black, and it's used in traditional printing methods. So um, that is one of the color methodologies out there. Oh, I see another comment in chat. Also really easy to get color codes with the floss tool GIMP. Jonathan, do you want to tell us more about that? I'm not familiar. Perhaps not. Perhaps that silence is a no. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't want to talk more about that. Okay. But that is awesome. Thank you, Jonathan, for the tip. Yes. Free it, <laughs> like Photoshop. Great. Thank you. And uh, I should probably state my bias, as you can already tell, is toward like things that a non-designer can do. <laughs> that is absolutely where I'm coming from. So. Okay, well, if there are no questions for Liz, or if they're sort of still percolating in your brain, I'm just going to start with some of the um, sort of Hub 101 end of the road um, steps for us. But uh, Liz, I think if you're able to stay, please do in that way. Um, if people have questions, yep. they can ask. Mm -hmm. So um, the first question, or excuse me, the first thing I'm going to put in the chat is the link to um, fill out if you're interested in joining the co-op. As you know, as participants in Pub 101, that is your pathway into joining the co-op. And we set it up like that just so that um, there's a baseline understanding of different publishing principles and um, sort of a, a jumping off point for all of us in the co-op. Um, I did create the form in such a way you may remember our conversation from last week when Paige was asking about um, her eligibility or prospects to join the co-op as an institution in a consortia. Um, you don't have to necessarily figure that out at this moment. If you just think, gosh, being in the co-op would be helpful, please let me know in this form and then I'll take it from there in terms of um, figuring out uh, your institutional eligibility. The co-op, I think, as you know, there's no additional fees. Um, really, it's just a community of people who are working in publishing and are there to support one another, share resources, and participate in future trainings. And so if you think you want to learn more about Pressbooks or learn more about Scribe, this same link is how you can let me know. Um, we're going to start those trainings in the new year. If I remember right, I think we've set aside um, four hours for each for the scribe and the Pressbooks pathways. So we would do something similar. We would meet uh, once a week for an hour for a month, and then you would have a foundation in that particular tool that you wouldn't have to learn at all during that time because you'd be in the co-op and you could turn to one another and ask questions and get help um, when you're actually working on a project, which is, I think, really helpful. Are there any questions about that? what the co-op is, how you join at the link, future trainings, why would I do this? Why wouldn't I do this? You guys are quiet today. 
Hey, Karen, it's Amanda Kirkford. Hi, Amanda. Hi, I'm just looking at the form to um, indicate that you want to join the publishing co-op and to say that you want training about the different um, pathways. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to say yes about the different pathways training if you're not quite sure how of you course. Think about it yet? Yes. <laughs> I, will not, I will not hold you to it and come for you. This, think of this much in the same way as the Pub 101 form. You're expressing interest. And then I'll follow up with next steps. There's no MOU to sign, no agreements. It's um, very informal um, in keeping with sort of the spirit of our getting together here. So wonderful. Thank, thank you for that question. Sure. Mandy asked if there will be future chances to join. Yes, this is not your last chance. Um, I will also be putting out a call for future Pub 101s. In the spring, I just got an email this morning from someone who um, wants to sign up right away, which is great. Um, so if now is not the right time, you can certainly wait. But again, there's nothing. There's no real obligation. There's not a commitment for the co-op itself, and so um, you're welcome to join the co-op and then choose to do a press books training later. Um, I'm sure we'll offer it more than once. Uh, we'll look at sort of a regular schedule. I hope in which we could offer those benefits. Thanks for your questions. It's nice to know you guys are out there. Okay, I'm gonna continue on with another link in the chat. <laughs> and that is the feedback form. Um, and I did do a thematic vi um, visual on our form to go with my hat. So let's come full circle on our tight ship here, maybe um there's a nice ship at the top of this form as your captain uh we're pulling into port on pub 101 and i really do need to know how this experience was for you um what you wish you would have learned more about what happened that maybe you didn't expect um and i floated a few ideas for how pub 101 could change in the future and i think um, as people who have experienced pub 101 and gone through it you would be the best to give your feedback about those ideas. Um, so please fill this out. We have extra time, so I think you could do it right now. Um, and that way I know more about your experience, especially since um, we had a larger group for much of the meetings and I couldn't try to interpret your facial expressions. This will give me <laughs> some additional information on how this experience has been for you. So please do that before you go today. And if you have any questions for Liz, feel free to unmute or put them in the chat. Otherwise, I think I might just um, sit here in awkward silence as you guys fill out Google Forms and um, say our farewells. But I'll, I'll pause for a minute and see if there's anything else. Oh, the goodbyes have started. Thanks, Tanya and Mandy. Oh, Nancy, congratulations, a new grandson, Monday night, very exciting. What is his name? Yulian J, is that right? That sounds like a Scandinavian name. Will we have access to Liz's slides? Yes, I will add a link to our orientation document where the links to other slides are. Thank you for reminding me um, of that. I'll do that hopefully today. Thanks for your feedback in the chat. It's nice to hear your um, parting words. I think I'm gonna go ahead and say our farewell, Liz. It seems like everyone um, got a lot of information from you. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us today. And I look forward to seeing you again in the new year, hopefully with some people in this call. And again, everyone, it was great. Thank you for joining in the first ever Pub 101 and giving it a go. And I really look forward to um, hopefully welcoming you into the co-op and seeing you again and reading your feedback in that form. So you have 12 remaining minutes. I think that's plenty of time um, for next steps. So thanks again, everybody, and farewell.